One of the issues that we need to face today is the controversy that still surrounds this issue. Now, we have official pronouncements now that humans are behind climate warming, behind global warming. This has been the warmest winter in the Northeast, at least, maybe in the world, I don't know, that we've ever had. Those of you who are new to Syracuse, you might have thought we had a cold, miserable winter, but oh no, it was really very nice. For you, it was a cold and miserable winter. Yeah. Yeah, where are you from? New York City. New York City. Well, why is New York City much warmer than Syracuse? Yeah, the ocean. The ocean. The thermal mass of the ocean around New York City. Keeps it warm in the winter, relatively warm in the winter, relatively cool. We are a continental situation here, and as a consequence, our temperatures are more variable. Okay. Um, and we have a group of 4,000 scientists, which I was once invited to be part of, but chose not to, who come out with official pronouncements from time to time. It's IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. <coughs> and every year they come out and say, well, this year was the second warmest ever, or the warmest ever, or whatever it is. <laughs> I think last year was the second warmest ever. And so we have, I think, three questions to conf confront us. Um, <coughs> is climate change real? That's number one. Number two is <coughs> Can we balance the carbon budget? This is the issue of the missing carbon. And the third is, if it is real, what can we do about it and what should we do about it? And we will try to address each of these three questions. Now, even back in uh, 1988, Sorry, this doesn't scan in real well. We have this issue of the New York Times that said global warming has begun. Now, in 1988, that was a good time to say it because we had a really hot summer. We all like the hot winters, warm winters, but the war <coughs> hot and warm summers are really maybe not so great either. And so an expert comes along, Jim Hansen, and this Russian guy, Sergei Lebedev, and he says, hey, look at this. Now, that sure looks like something's happening, right? But the skeptic says two things. Well, wait a minute. During all this time, we're supposed to be changing the climate, much of that time the temperature is going down. So we certainly must make the case, must make the argument that is the climate changing? Yes. Why can I say yes? Because the climate has always changed. Is there a greenhouse effect due to carbon dioxide, the expected culprit? carbon dioxide, the net output, the net result of burning carbonaceous fuels, oil, gas, coal. And I will tell you absolutely yes. Why is that? Because when planetary scientists look at <coughs> Venus and Mars, the Earth is in the middle, and predict the temperatures of the surface, the Earth is about 20 degrees centigrade or so warmer than it should be relative to its position from the sun. We should be colder. The reason we're not colder is because of the greenhouse effect. What is the greenhouse effect? The greenhouse effect 
is the warming of the Earth's atmosphere due to the molecules in the atmosphere that trap heat and keep it from leaving the surface of the Earth. Now, I want to show you how the greenhouse effect works. I would like, um, I would like about four relatively athletic fellows to come up here, please. Come on. Hang on. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, all the, all the jocks in the room. Come on, come on, come on. And I would like about four relatively athletic ladies also to come up here, but hang out in reserve. Got four guys yet? Come on, guys. You don't have to be a super jock, you know, you just have to be not. I did it once with a guy who just came out of the hospital with a broken arm. Okay, now, I want you ladies to hang out reserve over there. Now, you, you all have a big FF on you, and that means fossil fuel. All right, I want you four guys to do, you know what Brownian motion is? The random motion of gas molecules, right in this area here. Right about here, right about here. Now, whatever, until I tell you to stop, I want you to keep doing that. All right? George, get out of the way. <laughs> I am a photon. I am a photon coming from the sun. A photon is a high energy particle. And it comes into the Earth. Now, the Earth's surface is represented by that black box over there. And the photons come screaming in and push their way <laughs> through the atmosphere, hit the surface of the Earth, where they are transferred into low energy heat. We call it sensible heat. So when that heat hits the Earth's surface and re-radiates back to the outer space, it has a lot less energy. And when it hits these randomly moving particles, especially this one, <laughs> it's a lot harder for them to get out. And some of them are pushed back. And over time, most of them eventually <laughs> get through. Okay, who's got a match? So now we're going to ignite you fossil fuel <coughs> particles. And you're going to join the fossil fuel CO2 particle, like the non-fossil fuel, the natural fossil fuel that's already there. Now, the photons coming from the sun no drum. No, no. Why? Because they're high energy. But when they hit the surface of the earth, they are transformed into relatively casual saunterers low-energy saunterers, <coughs> and they come up and they start bumping in to a lot more particles, some of which <laughs> back to the Earth's surface, and that's kind of fun, you know? <laughs> Sometimes. Now, I've got to warn you, I used to play, I still do play hockey, and I can work my way through there if you want. <laughs> we haven't had any hip checks yet, so, but you got the idea. Thank you very much. Okay, that's the greenhouse effect. The idea is particles in, or molecules in the atmosphere reduce the rate and which heat escapes from the Earth 
and that goes to outer space. Is there a greenhouse? Absolutely. If not, the Earth would be frozen all the time. It would be entirely ice <coughs> by clear calculations of the amount of solar energy that comes in. So you can <coughs> imagine, may I borrow this for a moment, your head. <laughs> the greenhouse effect is keeping heat in the Earth like this, um, <coughs> I would say, environmentally benign uh, hat is keeping <laughs> the heat inside her head, any hat you put on, same idea. Because the heat is low energy, can't penetrate through this material. Now, what are <clears throat> the greenhouse gases? The most important is water vapor. If we had a third sex, we would have had them milling around up here as water vapor. Um, <clears throat> we have <clears throat> Uh, CO2, CO2 is the most important, not because it has a lot of greenhouse impact per molecule, but because there's a lot of molecules, relatively speaking. Methane, which comes from rice paddies and cows, is a greenhouse effect gas. Nitrous oxide and uh, chlorofluorocarbons, there are others. <clears throat> they are all greenhouse gases in that they contain the heat within the Earth's surface. Now, the Earth over a long time has about a constant temperature. Anybody know why that is? Heat radiates into space as a function of the nth power of the temperature of or anything radiates as a function of the fourth power of the temperature. Can you have that in physics? <coughs> physics? So, in other words, something that is important as it's raised to the fourth power, that's like squaring it twice. A little bit of increase in temperature means a whole lot of radiation going out to space. That has kept the Earth at a relatively, at relatively the same temperature for a whole long time. Now, of course, we've had ice ages. If you're ever really annoyed at Syracuse or ESF or SU or anything, just think. Only 12,000 years ago, this whole area was under 1,000 feet of ice. And probably sooner or later, maybe a long time, it will be again. So you're, you're just here in a temporary situation. Um, now, or maybe it won't. Maybe the greenhouse gases will go in the atmosphere and that will be it. Yeah? What causes a nice age? Uh -huh. <coughs> the most probable cause is Milankovitch cycles. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> Milankovitch cycles are celestial mechanics. How much the Earth wobbles as it goes around the sun. Those of you who are good at geometry, there's a they go, they go around in ellipses, and the Earth is at one foci. The question is, over time, sometimes the Earth is, is focusing, the angle of the Earth is such that the summertime is when it's closest to the sun. Then you've got hot summers and cold winters. Sometimes it's the other way, and you get more intermediate. Milankovitch cycles, there's one at, I don't know, 27,000 years, and one at 400,000 years, and maybe one at much shorter time periods. I probably should have an answer for that for you, but that's the most likely candidate. But there are others. One thing is, is, is the Earth and life and everything is dynamic. There's almost no steady state in anything that I know of, except in a laboratory situation. So that's part of the reason you have to learn calculus and you have to learn math. You have to understand how things change dynamically. You have to understand derivatives. Global climate change, is it real? Well, one of my greenhouse friend skeptics says, well, look at this. Let's, <laughs> his answer picked a very good time to start. Let's take this data set. He said we could do others. This is one I happen to have. Excuse me, I've got to get it right. And there we go, 1890. Overlays pretty well, right? More or less. Y'all see? But this is the longer data set. 
And what do we have here? We have much higher temperatures earlier than 1880 or so. That data set looks like this. Did Hansen cheat? Did he start here and just give you this data for the New York Times? Hmm. What happened in 1880? Begins with K. Krakatoa. Who can tell me what Krakatoa is? Yes, ma'am. Big explosive volcano in the South Pacific. Boom! And what's it do? What's a big explosive volcano do? It puts all kinds of crap up in the atmosphere. Mostly, of most importance, is sulfates. And what do those sulfates do? Is that they absorb the incoming solar radiation, that fast stuff coming in. And reduces the temperature of the Earth. They say after Krakatoa that ponds froze every month in Connecticut, including August. I don't know how true that is, but that's what they say. Okay, so maybe this is a bunch of hooey. Maybe the scientists who want to believe in the greenhouse effect are misusing the data. Now let's take Geneva, New York. Geneva, New York is where Cornell has an agricultural experimental station. <coughs> These are all Lewisburg, Tennessee, Itasca, Minnesota, Beeville, Texas. They've got a bunch, a whole bunch of these graphs. And a guy who didn't believe in global warming, because what happens in Florida with the oranges every year? They're freezing where they didn't used to freeze. He says things are getting colder. Look at the data from Geneva, New York. The data from Geneva, New York certainly doesn't indicate any warming. Lewisburg, Tennessee, Itasca, Minnesota certainly doesn't indicate warming. It may indicate cooling. Well, people said this is a problem. The problem because of the tarmac effect, T-A-R-M-A-K, the tarmac effect. The tarmac effect, what, what, where do we have weather stations? Who cares about the weather? Travelers, who in particular? Airports. Pilots, <laughs> airports. Yeah, they got to care a whole lot. So where do we find our thermometers? At airports. Who's been to Colorado recently? Denver. Who's been to Atlanta recently? <coughs> What is going on in airports? They're paving entire counties <coughs> to handle all these airplanes and stuff. All the affluent kids from ESF going down to the Miami and the tropics for the spring breaks and so forth. So, um, what do you do when you paint your world black? You increase the absorption of heat. So, these skeptics argue that what's going on is the tarmac effect. That we're increasing the temperature only because we're paving the areas around the thermometers. Hmm. How's that sound? Hmm? Logical. Well, the guys who worried about that, so they launch a satellite. They say, well, we'll look at the temperature of the Earth from a satellite so we're not dependent upon areas that are surrounded by tarmac. We'll launch a satellite that's going to look at all of the Earth. Big problem we're having is we're having some problems with the collapse of uh, many governments as the weather stations are not being maintained in, in parts of the world. But we'll get it from the from the uh, satellite. And the satellite data first came in, it showed that the Earth wasn't warming, it was cooling. And in addition, there's a tremendously tight 
correlation <coughs> between the sun, the activity of the sun as indicated by sunspot activity, and temperatures. So that's a pretty strong case, wouldn't you say? Against these 4,000 scientists say that there's global warming. <coughs> Even so, I'm going to stand before you today and tell you I think this is probably the biggest problem. CO2 increase, global warming, is probably the biggest environmental, meaning total, problem, problem that humanity is going to face. Why do I say that? What's going on? Well, I've got to take you through some science. It's a fascinating <coughs> journey for me. I went to a big talk on carbon, global carbon, at Brookhaven Laboratory, where I was a postdoc in 1972, and really got into this stuff. And I've been now publishing for more than 30 years on these issues. A lot of my own research has been on this. So let's see where, what other science we can bring to bear. Let's see why there remain some controversies, and so on. OK, so be ready. The first thing, and I, I won't get into this in any detail, but one of the reasons I find it so <coughs> interesting is that in order to understand this problem, it's a systems-oriented problem. And if you go back to the first lecture, you will, well, actually all problems are systems-oriented, but this is one in which it's truly recognized. If you go back to our first lecture, I remember we talked about drawing systems diagrams and how all these things were connected. Well, that's also especially the case here. So these are different disciplines <clears throat> that you need to involve in order to try to understand the future of our climate and of our human welfare. You have to understand sun, so you bring in solar physicists. You have to understand volcanoes. It's called external forcing. Forcing means something from outside the system that causes changes <coughs> in the system. You need stratospheric chemistry dynamics. You need ocean dynamics. You need atmospheric physics. You need physical climate systems people. You need terrestrial energy and moisture. Soil people. Marine biogeochemistry. Terrestrial ecosystem people. That's where I work mostly. Trophospheric chemistry. <coughs> Human activities. Land use. Land use change affecting terrestrial ecosystems and affecting all the rest of these things. Human activities through fossil fuel affecting uh, trophospheric chemistry, pollutants like dust from volcanoes and dust from agriculture coming into the game. Climate change then, in fact, feeding back and causing all of these other things to change. Whoa, what a complicated system. It isn't easy to understand. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to do as a scientist. Okay, it's obviously got a, a lot of um, press. So you all have heard about these kinds of things. So here, here's a bell jar protecting this, uh, uh, I guess, politically correct American family from the impacts of changing climate. Next. It's a great concern to me because if it keeps going, apparently according to this article, then we're perhaps going to lose uh, this part of the world, Patagonia, which is my favorite part of the world, and I'll miss it dearly. Next. OK, how does it work? We showed you how it worked. The high energy solar input comes in, there's a greenhouse blanket, it's incorrectly shown as being up in the atmosphere, it's mixed thoroughly in the atmosphere. There's interactions from fossil fuel combustion going into the atmosphere, waste disposal, methane from landfills, all kinds of stuff. Plants go back and forth, they take up CO2 <coughs> and they put it back, and there's always interaction back and forth with the oceans through the Coca-Cola effect. How do you make Coca-Cola? Well, you take sugar and some other stuff that won't let you know what it is, and you burn it, producing some really toxic carcinogens. And you put it, you mix it in water, you put it in a big tank, and you blow CO2, carbon dioxide, the 
Carbon dioxide is what you exhale, for example, as a consequence of your metabolism, or what's generated when you burn fuel. This, uh, it's the end product of the oxidation of reduced fuels. You want to look at it that way. So the CO2, you put it in a tank above who's got a Coke here. Anybody got a Coke? Or a, a carbonated soft drink of any kind? No? Well, we'll pretend this is carbonated. Yeah, this one back there, well, then this is Coke. And what they do is when they make it, they take a great big tank and with some atmosphere above it and they squirt in the CO2 and the CO2 goes into the Coke. That's how you get those city things that tickle your tummy in here. Well, that's what we're doing to the ocean. We're, we're squirting uh, CO2 into the atmosphere and it's by uh, fixed law of diffusion, remember that? Uh, CO2 is going into the ocean. And increasing in the CO2 in the ocean over time. And um, the trouble is that it's not going into the ocean fast enough. And in, in more advanced courses you take with me, we'll go through the same lecture again, but we'll go into a lot more physics of how all this stuff works. Okay, next. Uh, here's another picture of the solar radiation coming in and all the CO2 <laughs> coming out from fossil fuel burning from cities and from agriculture, putting in especially methane and ammonia from cows with a, the stomachs of cows adds especially large amount of methane to the atmosphere and uh, methane is very potent greenhouse gas and from the destruction of tropical forests. <coughs> Next, would you, now, hey, isn't this the guy who came up with the greenhouse theory? The climate could get colder. There may be other things that are going on. You may have a whole string of great big volcanoes that put us back into the ice age. Humanity <coughs> has evolved during a period of unusually benign climate conditions, especially in the past 100 or 200 years. It's been unusually favorable for agriculture. What will the future be? Hard to say. Can you support 6.2 billion people if the climate changes? Ooh, good question. Okay. Now, what's the main source of data that we have from this, from a place called Mauna Loa, which is the largest mountain in the world, but half of it's covered by the ocean. It's in Hawaii. Great big uh, volcanic uh, cone like that. With, uh, you know, incidentally, you look at Hawaii, the whole series of them like that, it's just a plate floating over a hot spot in the Earth's surface. Puts up the islands one at a time, and we'll continue to do so. One of these is Mauna Loa. And at the top of Mauna Loa is a beautiful place to do these studies because you're very far away from industrial contamination. You want to measure the atmosphere in general. You don't want to measure the local uh, effects. For example, when I was at Brookhaven and we were measuring CO2 at Brookhaven, every time at 5 o'clock when everybody went home, whoosh, the CO2 in our tower that was uh, a mile from the traffic would spike. So you, the good thing about Mauna Loa in Hawaii is that if you remember your trade winds, you got 2,000 miles of mixing upwind from the trade winds that are coming into uh, Mauna Loa. And so you get this data, and it shows two things. A, a big increase over time. Now, incidentally, uh, zero is down here. If you plotted it with zero on the scale, it wouldn't look quite so dramatic. It's increased about 30% since the pre-industrial times. And you also see a wiggle, very, very clear wiggle. And what they are is, is the carbon's being taken up by the growing trees during the northern hemisphere summer and released during the northern hemisphere winter. You can see the effects, just barely see the effects of when you have a, uh, the oil price, I guess, let's see, seven, right there, oil price increases uh, in global depressions. When business activity slows down a bit, the CO2 <coughs> increase in the atmosphere slows down a bit too. So what's good for business is uh, either good for the CO2 in the air or bad for our future. Figure it out. <coughs> Not sure. Okay, next. <coughs> Uh, you get a big cycles in the northern hemisphere where there's a lot of terrestrial mass. Most of this is done by the terrestrial 
uh, plants in the southern hemisphere, the cycles are 180 degrees out of phase. You see this is three years. So here's a uh, winter in the northern hemisphere and the growing season sucks it down, <coughs> especially as you get to more northern latitudes. So in the southern hemisphere, the peak is, the peak in CO2 is 180 degrees out of phase with the northern hemisphere and the wiggles are much less because there's lot much less vegetation, terrestrial vegetation in the northern and southern hemisphere. <coughs> Next. U.S. produces about a quarter, maybe 20% of the CO2. Next. But here's a picture I took in uh, Suzhou in China. Uh, and I took all these pictures just because they were, you know, I'm a tourist. I'm actually teaching over there, but this was one of the days off I had, and so I'm taking all these pictures. This is the Venice of China, lovely, wonderful city. But all my pictures of, you look in the background, and they're all smokestacks. So the U.S. has produced most of the CO2 to debate to date, but the real changes in CO2 are coming from countries like China and India, where the, their economies are expanding one time 12% a year. It's all based on coal, because that's basically the only fossil fuel that China has. Next. Some of it comes from tropical deforestation. Here's a, an area that's been cut in cultivation. Next. Uh, here's a pretty depressing view of what the Amazon Basin, which is our largest area of undisturbed forest, uh, might be by the year 2020. So uh, maybe there will be a lot more <coughs> Tropical deforestation. You may live long enough to see the end of tropical forests, isn't that something? Other than in preserves. When I grew up, these were, when I was a kid, these were totally enormous, undiscovered, un, undisturbed areas. Just my lifetime I've watched this happen. Next. Methane is increasing rapidly in the atmosphere, a more powerful greenhouse gas. Next. Uh, now, let's start looking at <clears throat> some of the arguments that have been used against CO2. The first is that the temperature has been declining during a period in which we've been putting more and more CO2 in the atmosphere. That doesn't make sense, does it? Uh, that's not so clear in the southern hemisphere. Well, I think we understand it now. Fossil fuel does not simply put CO2 in the air, it puts all kinds of stuff in the air, including dust. And that dust filters out some of the incoming <coughs> solar radiation, cooling the earth, compensating for some of the warming due to CO2. Now the dust comes out in a matter of a few weeks or maybe a year. CO2 goes in the air and it stays there. So it has a cumulative effect. So people are arguing now that the, the CO2 effect now, because it's cumulative, is overriding the dust effect, which is basically goes in, comes out, goes in, goes out. That was important for a while here, but the cumulative effect of CO2, in many people's thinking, including mine, uh, is compensating for that. And we're likely, unlikely to see another reduction like that due to dust unless the volcanoes get active again. Y'all follow that? It's kind of complicated. It's, it's the immediate effect versus the cumulative effect. Cumulative accumulating. CO, let's just put it this way. In this room, almost certainly, are molecules of CO2 that were put into the atmosphere when my father drove my mother to the hospital in 1943 to have me. They're still there. Don't go away. It go very, very slowly into the ocean, but it will take tens of thousands of years for the ocean to soak up. So basically, whatever we're doing, we're with it. Next, we're gonna, it's gonna, we have to live with it. Next. Now in the past, <clears throat> this is a Venice Lagoon in, in Italy. In the past, uh, the world was cooler. Now how much of that is due to greenhouse effect and how much of it is due to natural climate change? And that's a fascinating story that people are trying to unravel. Also notice no trees on the hillside. They're all cut to make ships to go and fight the Turks. 
Now, I told you the satellite showed you that the uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, that the, excuse me, that the temperature of the Earth was decreasing. Well, there was, this is a lovely story. There was a mathematics professor in high school, teacher, in England. And he says, what's going on here, you know? And he was very fascinating, fascinated in the geometry of satellite orbits. And he would uh, do, on his uh, personal computer, he would do some analyses of what the, the data that was available, that scientists made available. And, and he found these guys made a mistake. And they said, he said, hey, I don't think you guys corrected for the fact that over time, the satellite is falling closer to the Earth. And that's giving you an erroneously, an erroneously low temperature. And all these big deal PhDs. Whoops. <coughs> Whoops. Uh, hmm. <laughs> this high school teacher caught us with egg on her face. And he's right. So you corrected for what this mathematician, high school teacher, found. And in fact, you find out that the temperature increase <coughs> that occurred is about the same as the thermometers. And they took out all the thermometers in the, in this, in the airports. And they've done all of that, and the temperature is still increasing. Indicating that maybe some, this is real. Next. Now, what do we know? What's the evidence that the CO2 effect is, the greenhouse effect is occurring? Number one, the ocean level is rising. The ocean's getting warmer. As it gets warmer, it expands. Yesterday, we heard on the news that an area of ice from Antarctica fell off. It's as big as Rhode Island. These things didn't used to happen. One a couple of years ago, as big as Delaware fell off. So parts of Antarctica are melting. Other parts, not. Next. Uh, here's somebody's predictions into the future. The people who run New York City subways have to think about this. Let alone poor people in Bangladesh who live in uh, areas that are just a, a few centimeters above sea level. There are entire countries like the Seychelles who will disappear in 50 years if this continues. Next. Another thing is the melting of glaciers. Uh, uh, here in Montana and Glacier Park and all over the place, we have the melting of glaciers. My wife has studied that. She's done beautiful work on that, uh, especially in Glacier Park. So everywhere we go, we've got to go visit the glaciers. So here's some pictures of next. Glaciers melting in Argentina. And this is incredible. Petit, uh, Perito Moreno. Uh, glacier. Next shot. Look at that. <clears throat> that incredible. It's the third largest ice mass in the world. Well, this too is melting. And you know, you're there in huge, huge chunks of ice here. Here's people, you know, and that's a mile away. While you're there, huge chunks of this ice fall off and go down and, and leave big holes in the <coughs> water and make huge rumbling noises. It's, it's fantastic. Argentina, they all think climate's changing. They've had to abandon 4,000 estancias in Patagonia because it's gotten too dry and too hot for their sheep. Uh, without going it, into it in any detail, one of the other lines of evidence is that the upper atmosphere, these are predicted by different models, the upper atmosphere is getting cooler. The consequence of less heat escaping to the upper atmosphere. This was predicted by computer models, and finally they got around to measuring it. And the measurements they find more or less agree with the models. That is a non-trivial prediction of the model that was later borne out by the data. Next. Uh, you can look in the past with paleoclimatology. Uh, next, we're going to go through this pretty fast here. Next. Uh, you can look at ice cores. You can get a history by drilling down in the ice. You can look at tree rings. You can look at tree rings. Uh, some trees are 6,000 years old, present cone pines. And when they were making their rings, when they were little baby pine trees, they were making a record 
of the carbon concentration, the carbon characteristics, the isotope characteristics of the atmosphere that they lived in. You can take ocean sediments and lake sediments. Next. And what do you find? Well, you find a lot of variability <coughs> in the past. And then you decide. Is what's going on now new? I think so. I think so. Uh, and we won't get into the detail, but just look at here, South America, Africa, India, Australia, Syracuse, um, on all of them. And, and you look into the future, and the predictions are that the soil will dry out. The droughts that now occur one year in 100 will occur 60 or more years in 100. Because even though rainfall is likely to increase because there's more energy evaporating, more water from the sea, then simultaneously you're going to have more evapotranspiration, more evaporation off the land and transpiration through the trees because the air will be warmer. And the net effect will be a drying of the soil. Okay, let's look at how, why I think this is going to continue. Next. Um, I think we've seen this. This is the GNP of the United States and the use of energy in the United States. How do we make wealth? We make it by burning fuels. Period. More or less. And every country in the world is trying to do what we did so successfully. Next. Here's the CO2 in the atmosphere up to 1985, 1990. Looks sort of like exponential growth. You can see the effects of the economic contractions and the oil crises of the 70s. Keep this in mind. Next. This is what was thought to be the input of carbon. Man, you guys are going to see some real action. We go through that fossil fuel. Either this will happen or civilizations will collapse. Take your pick. Because um, we can't support 6.2 billion people without the use of energy in agriculture. We just can't do it, like we showed in Costa Rica, like Dr. Pimentel <coughs> said. I don't like it, but it's, it's a fact. Now, here's the, the Hubbard curve of the use of CO2 over time. Next. That's the same curve, more or less, drawn here. The thing about the CO2 is, understand this, please. If you don't understand anything else, it's cumulative. Even when the CO2 starts going down, the CO2 in the atmosphere can continue to increase because it's cumulative. You're just adding more and more molecules in, and they only go back into the oceans a very little bit. So here's where we are now, 2002. We have barely begun to change the CO2 in the atmosphere compared to what will happen in your lifetime, assuming we continue on the track that we are on now. So here's, in the past, here's the CO2 from an ice core, 160,000 years ago to today, till today. Here's the temperature. This is where we're going. Where's the temperature going to go? <coughs> Maybe up. Next. Uh, human population, of course, growth is behind it. Now we're up here. Good old Dr. Bartlett coming home to roost here. Next. There's all kinds of people out saying there that this is not true. This guy, uh, Ross Gelbspan, who wrote a wonderful book, The Heat Is On, going after those scientists that said this is not happening, many of whom are paid for by the oil companies and the automobile companies. 